Well, good afternoon, everyone. Do we all need to collectively stand up and then sit down again to get some additional energy or, or what? I'm not sure. But let me, uh, oh yeah, there we go. We have some volunteers willing to do it, so that means you have extra energy. And uh, maybe we can send that over to this part of the room. We'll see. Uh, but let me just begin by introducing myself. My name is Mark Pacheco. I'm the Senate President Pro Temp of the Massachusetts uh, Senate and the founding chair of the Global Warming and Climate Change Committee in the, uh, in the Senate in Massachusetts. And we have today with us who will be primarily uh, talking to us about the subject matter in which you're here to listen to, uh, Guy uh, Nordenson, uh, professor here at Princeton. And I'm very interested in listening to uh, his, uh, his suggestions and his observations about what is taking place relative to the issue of resiliency and planning and what we can be doing as a, as a region and what we should be doing throughout the country and the world relative to uh, the aspect of trying to respond to uh, some of the worst effects of uh, global climate change that are already upon us. And if you don't think it's already upon us, and I know everybody here uh, agrees, at least I hope you do agree, that it's already upon us, then all you have to do is look at the some $350 billion that have been spent uh, just in the last uh, several uh, severe uh, weather events that we've experienced, uh, uh, you know, many of which were in uh, the Northeast. It is, uh, it is amazing uh, the changes that we're seeing uh, environmentally uh, and what we're seeing in terms of uh, the, the, the amount of precipitation, uh, the, the coastal flooding, uh, sea level rise uh, that is taking place, and we are ill-prepared right now to respond to what is already happening, never mind what is coming. And let me tell you why I say that. I took the train down uh, to be here uh, at Princeton. I went up to, I, w I, w I was, went up to Trenton, came to Trenton, and then got a ride over to uh, the university here. And on my ride, I took the Acela, and I love taking the Acela, I love taking the train, whether it's to New York or Washington, I love traveling by train. Except for that section of track that is right around Rhode Island in parts of Connecticut, where I look out the window and I could almost touch the water. And I'm saying to myself, boy, have we got a massive multi-billion dollar problem coming just with rail across uh, the United States on both coasts. So there are issues that really we need to be planning on. Uh, in Massachusetts, before I turn it over to uh, uh, the professor, in Massachusetts, we are trying to get past a comprehensive adaptation management uh, plan uh, that would be set forth in state statute, which would give authorization to the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs and the Secretary of Public Safety to work across agency to put in place uh, the initiative of doing a statewide vulnerability analysis. So we actually start to look at those vulnerable areas that will obviously be impacted. Uh, those of you that have seen what has happened uh, to us in the last couple of storms, Boston is uh, uh, pretty much a city that has been you know, filled in the ocean. And, and if we don't uh, pay attention to uh, what is taking place, uh, in, in we're going to see a lot of the city, you know, not, you know, not there any longer. And some people will be very lucky because uh, I talked to somebody that had an apartment here. One of the legislators from New Jersey has a, 
as a unit in Back Bay. I said, well, it might be oceanfront property in a few years. So we, we really need to be doing the planning uh, so that we can identify where the critical areas are so we can move forward with resiliency. And one of those areas of resiliency that is so important, obviously, is in the built environment. And the professor that we'll be talking with today is an expert in this area, uh, with architecture, with the built environment, and uh, what we should all be considering. And I'd ask, I'd ask him to, along the way, maybe give us a piece of advice or two as you're giving your presentation as to what legislators should be looking at uh, as we contemplate what we may do in terms of the area, uh, in terms of resiliency and planning uh, so that we can do the best job we can do uh, for our constituents in our respective districts. So without uh, further ado, let me turn over in his resume is in the, is in the uh, uh, you know, information that has been handed out by Professor um, Guy Nonson. Professor. I'm going to give you a round of applause just to get anybody going. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, briefly, uh, so we have more time for conversation and discussion, about work that we've been doing here at Princeton for almost a decade, trying to develop a marriage of science and design uh, and a uh, overall strategy about how to approach coastal um, resilience. Uh, this started out a number of years ago with a project that uh, we did here with a group of students, which was a proposal for how to transform the New York Harbor area um, by building out in the water new structures <coughs> that would improve the resilience, but also improve the ecology and provide the means for adaptation as the sea level um, rises. As you know, in the New York area, for example, as sea level goes up, many of the coastal wetlands are submerged, and so what's important for the health of the bay is to find ways to replace that ecology, and there's not a whole lot of room going inland, so one of the ways to deal with that is out in the water, and our theme was to think about <clears throat> going out in the water to deal with some of these issues, which at the time that we were working on this was a bit um, taboo. There was a lot of opposition in New York in particular to building anything in the water, which was remaining from many of the battles um, over infrastructure, including the Westway, uh, that was proposed to be built along the west side of Manhattan, where the intervention in the water was going to destroy ecology. So coming along here and saying that to preserve ecology it made sense to go out in the water was somewhat um, unconventional. And part of what we were trying to do with this was to show how adaptation could actually provide improvements and positive um, opportunities for a place like New York. So we took at our site the New York Harbor, <coughs> um, the up, what's called the Upper Harbor, and what we called Palisade Bay, and imagined ways in which we could build islands in the water, we could transform the edge, um, add oyster beds and other things which would improve the ecology, but also help provide some nature-based um, features that would also improve the resilience in the event of a storm. Um, based on that um, early research, I then helped organize an exhibition in New York at the Museum of Modern Art called Rising Currents, which was uh, a somewhat unusual event at MoMA in that it brought this issue of climate change and sea level rise into a museum of art, and as a result got a lot of attention. And this was organized um, in the same place that we'd done the earlier research, and the idea here was to bring teams that combined architects, landscape architects, and scientists and engineers to imagine ways, again, of transforming this location the upper harbor of New York to pre uh, prepare for, for sea level rise, but also for storms. <coughs> um, sorry, I'm just recovering from a cold. The, um, this all led up to then um, the, the Hurricane Sandy 
um, in, in 2012, and then many of the responses to Sandy were um, incorporating some of the stuff that we had done. So there was a, a state commission set up by Cuomo which looked at ways in which the state could start to prepare. Um, it's a good document. You can find it online. Um, for some reason, um, it didn't have much of an afterlife, but it's really a good resource for what New York State could do to prepare itself for the consequences of climate change, including the coastal um, uh, ideas that we had been pushing um, before that, which were incorporated, mainly giving nature a role, giving um, soft infrastructure a role in the protection of the coastline, but also thinking about the changes that have to happen as potentially positive changes for the region. Similarly, uh, the city of New York incorporated a lot of these ideas in their waterfront plan, and also um, later in a really interesting document that um, Mayor Bloomberg um, organized over the course of about six or seven months after um, Sandy, which created a whole series of proposals for the New York region. All this stuff is available online still, and it's all very useful documents for um, sort of examples of how to think through this problem in considerable detail. Um, one of the things that New York has, which Bloomberg set up, which helped in this particular process, is something called the New York City Panel on Climate Change which I would um, recommend as a concept for other states. This is a group, actually a city group, that was set up, modeled after the International Panel on Climate Change, but which is focused on downscaling those um, international um, uh, studies and, and research to give uh, rigorous predictions for the city of New York regarding the effects of climate change over the next century not just sea level rise, but also rain events, heat waves, and other, other consequences, so that the various agencies can plan on a common basis what to do with their uh, facilities. So back to this proposal, um, Sayers' proposal, one thing that's important about what Bloomberg advanced with this report um, was that it was necessary to approach the problem by a whole series of small interventions, not one grand gesture, not one big storm barrier, but actually a lot of small projects that could be implemented over time that would protect individual communities. This is somewhat controversial because in some ways we can't really approach this problem without looking at it comprehensively, but it's also realistic. What Bloomberg was trying to do with this report was to set the stage for the expenditure of the monies that were coming from the federal government through HUD and other agencies and point them in the direction of priorities for the state. And so the rush in getting this report done was to be prepared for when the money came to know what to um, do with it. Parallel to that, um, Sean Donovan, who was the secretary of HUD at the time, who's trained as an architect, organized an interesting competition called Rebuild by Design, which was funded in part by the Rockefeller Foundation. Interestingly enough, the original commission, New York's uh, NYS 2100 that I showed you, was also organized by Rockefeller Foundation. They, um, for a while, were really committed to the idea of resilience. They also created a group called 100 Resilient Cities that's still active. All of this was under the presidency of Judith Roden, who was very um, strongly committed to this, this um, line of research. And so she, together with HUD, sponsored this competition, which again was meant to bring architects and designers and scientists together to develop proposals for the protection of New York. So following up on um, some of the preparatory work that Bloomberg's group had done, Rebuild by Design then assigned to each team particular locations where they were supposed to work. They came up with proposals and then in a competitive process um, before a jury, they were judged and a small number of them were then selected to receive altogether almost a billion dollars in funding. And so HUD money was assigned through this competitive process to the various projects. One I'm showing you here for lower and eastern part of Manhattan to provide new um, 
uh, landscape protection against flooding. Other projects include um, living breakwaters off the edge of Staten Island and so on. It's a little different than the Army Corps coming along and building typical gray infrastructure. Um, it's a little different than HUD simply giving the money to communities through the community block grants. This was a process that was trying to build community support but also engage designers um, in thinking through facilities that would provide protection but also provide a lot of benefits, other benefits to those communities. We had a parallel project also sponsored by um, Rockefeller, which we called Structures of Coastal Resilience, which was an effort on our part to come up with um, strategies that could be adopted by the Army Corps for their um, work across the North Atlantic region. Um, we pulled together four different teams um, uh, up at Harvard, at City College in New York, here at Princeton, and at Penn, all led by landscape architects and architects that were to develop strategies in those three, in those four locations and test those strategies using um, some of the research happening here in the effect of climate change on hurricanes and storms. This was married to the North Atlantic um, plan that the Army Corps was required to prepare for Congress at that time. So we were injecting as best we could innovative thinking and ideas and approaches into their, um, into their work. So we picked uh, Rhode Island, Jamaica Bay, <coughs> Atlantic City, and Norfolk, and assigned to each of the teams from the four different universities one of those sites. And then here at Princeton, we had a small team that looked at how we could use the best available science to develop predictions for what climate change was going to do to the coastal storms in those places. One part of that was to build on work that's happened here, uh, led by uh, Bob Kopp up at Rutgers and also uh, Michael Oppenheimer here at Princeton to develop regional-based sea level rise predictions that are probabilistic. So looking at the best um, understanding of what the interaction of sea level rise and ground shifting uh, does to these different locations and incorporating that in our work. And then using an innovative approach to the storm prediction that was, has originated both here at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab in Princeton, but also at MIT with Kerry Emanuel, looking at the effect of climate change on hurricanes through the same simulations that are used by the National Panel on Climate Change to predict the effect of different types of emission scenarios on um, on the atmosphere and the oceans. So the models that are used, the global circulation models that are used, of which there are a little over 30 around the world, are potential, um, if you will, digital laboratories within which you can create synthetic hurricanes that follow the laws of physics, both under current climate conditions and future climate conditions. And the advantage of going through this process is that you can generate thousands and thousands of synthetic hurricanes which may capture some of the circumstances that are not in our historical records. So for example, Sandy is a kind of hurricane that had never occurred before. So we didn't know it was coming the way it combined nor'easter with a hurricane because we hadn't had one before. The advantage of the approach using the GCMs is that you can capture some of those um, types of storms that haven't occurred in our recorded history through this process, and you have a large enough base from which to develop statistical models for, um, for what's likely to happen in the future, and you can anticipate what these um, emission scenarios will do to the hurricane. So we've been working on this. Um, this is the work that was done here by Ning Lin and her team um, for the project uh, a couple years ago. She's continuing to do that work, as is Kara Manuel at MIT. And this, we believe, is a good way to approach the prediction of the changes in the hurricane regime over time. So we, we use this <coughs> in order to study what would happen in a couple of different locations, and I'll just show you two. This is a community built on a wetland behind Atlantic City called Chelsea Heights, which was badly flooded in Sandy. 
um, all low-lying, all built, you know, really in a place that probably shouldn't have been built on. It's, it's all Back Bay um, wetland. And the proposal in this project and many other projects that we're trying to promote is to always approach uh, the, the coastal resilience through a combination of, of layers and features. And so we believe that it's always important to include offshore structures that help dissipate wave energy, but also protect whatever onshore structures you have against erosion over time. So living breakwaters, oyster beds, all kinds of features out in the water, uh, islands, wetlands, and so on, that can be constructed, but are natural features, together with edge protection of some kind, levees, seawalls, dikes, etc. But also anticipating the likelihood that there will be some storms that overtop those edge protections, planning in the back of those protections in the communities for a certain amount of flooding in very extreme events. So planning, edge protection, and offshore structures, we believe, are important together. And so in this example that Paul Lewis here at Princeton developed, the idea for this community over time is to develop this combination by lifting the roads, providing edge protection, providing wetlands along the edge, and also in this case, also some irrigation by introducing canals, a little bit like Venice out in California, where you get water coming in and out that can help to feed um, some of the abandoned lots and turn them into um, uh, greener um, natural features and make the community a little bit more attractive and, and, and livable, and in a storm, help drain out the water that, that might come in. So by raising the roads, you create a series of, of layers of protection that keep the water out, even if it does happen to overtop the protection you put on the edge. In Jamaica Bay, <coughs> we've been working and are continuing to work on a comprehensive strategy to provide some transformation and protection there. And in this project and all the other ones, we're developing those strategies in um, GIS model, in digital elevation models, both of existing and proposed future conditions, and then trying to see how those future conditions and transformations look as time moves forward. So we lay these out in these matrices that look in the vertical axis at different probability levels, including at the bottom very extreme events um, that might not occur but could occur, so even more severe than Sandy, but also at more frequent flooding at the top, king tides that more and more are starting to become a nuisance for many of the communities around this place, and then see how that in different time slices changes. So it gives you an overall perspective on the likelihood of events and the changing character of those events um, over time into the future, and then you can start to chart how different strategies get implemented, but also how they perform. Um, finally, I think this is an important part of this whole story. <clears throat> One of the reasons why we are trying to develop alternative approaches to estimating the flood hazard is that more and more it's clear, I think, to many uh, that our current estimates of what the flood hazards are along the coast and even along our rivers are not particularly reliable. Uh, there is many um, cases where, depending on who you ask, you get different results. The maps that are produced by FEMA are often contested. Um, they often prove to be not particularly well grounded. So, for example, in New York, we went through a whole process of questioning the maps, the current maps that are produced by FEMA, and discovered that there were a number of severe flaws that undermined their credibility. From region to region, you see their discrepancies in the way in which they're developed and produced. There are many reasons for this, um, and I think a so massive reform is really required so that we can get to a point where we have a reliable understanding and estimate of what the um, hazards are that we're trying to deal with. And there are ways of doing this. Um, there uh, was a process initiated in the 1970s to develop national maps of earthquake hazards under a um, legislature called the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, 
which was quite successful over a period of 30 or 40 years working with USGS and other agencies to develop open source, publicly um, available and understandable uh, maps for earthquake hazards throughout the United States, which have now become quite dependable and reliable and, um, and the foundation of much uh, improved safety in um, earthquake areas, not just in California, but even here on the East Coast in Boston, for example. Something like that is, I think, necessary in order to get a better handle and a more reliable handle on what we're dealing with in terms of flood hazards um, up and down the coast, in the Gulf, and even on the West Coast dealing with um, tsunamis, so that as a, as a nation we have a better understanding, a more reliable understanding of that threat, and then are able to apply with more confidence um, strategies like the ones that I've shown you. So with that, uh, finally, if you're interested in this stuff, there's a good website with all our material, and we're about to publish a book in a couple of weeks on this work as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And, and because of our <coughs> extended break, we're running right up to the, uh, the next uh, forum. But we did want to have an opportunity for a few questions from the audience, uh, if anybody has one. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, thank you for thank you for your talk. I was wondering if um, if you could talk about uh, how much money you'd expect a state would have to spend in order to build up these structures, and over what time frame? Money to do what? To to build coastal re resiliency. Like, how much is there an order of magnitude? How much money you'd need to build to build the resilience? Yes, a lot. <laughs> Are we talking millions, billions? More than billions, for sure. Over? I, I don't have an idea, no. I mean, I, you know, I, part of the feel, my feeling is that um, we don't even have a good handle on what the problem is. So it's really hard to get an idea of how to um, deal with it if we have this moving target of what the, um, what the flooding hazards are for us in the future. One of the things uh, as well I think that we all have to consider is the cost of inaction. And the cost of inaction in most cases ends up being far greater than what the cost of doing some upfront planning and assessment uh, as we as we move forward. Yes, sir. Yeah, Guy, I've heard you give this presentation a few times, but I had an aha moment listening. It was probably nutty. But we've talked today earlier about the ways in which offshore wind is going to be creating a lot of civil engineering to put the, the platforms together, the generally ocean bottom mounted platforms until the water is quite deep. So a lot, of earth, a lot of earth system engineering is going to go on uh, at distances of 10 to 20 miles from the coast. And is there a way to have a twofer here? We've never, has anybody been thinking about these quite substantial amounts of money that can be built, spent on putting piles of dirt onto the bottom until they get above the ground, above the ocean surface, and do them in places and in ways which give you wave attenuation and things like the storm surge attenuation. I've not heard those put together. Perhaps you have. No, it's a great idea. Um, I mean, as you know, the, the waves are the waves that could be interfered with by the, those platforms way out offshore. Um, and then the other waves that will regroup on the inside um, from, because there's enough fetch to generate those waves. So you, you, you know, potentially could filter out some of the longer period waves. Um, and I don't know of anyone who's studied how that might have an impact, but it sounds like a great idea. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, it is. And I, I can tell you that uh, 
uh, based upon the research that I know is going on now for the siting of uh, uh, the uh, turbines off the coast of Massachusetts, and certainly the same thing is being looked at in New Jersey and New York, you know, state, etc. That there is a lot of science that is going into it as as deemed uh, appropriate by the leasing of the ocean uh, to these uh, to these companies. But I think you're, you're correct. At the same time, that science needs to be shared uh, so that it will, it will help us in terms of looking at resiliency issues, you know, going forward as well. Yes. yes. Uh, sure. During Hurricane Sandy, a uh, number of substations got flooded in New Jersey and also because of the storm surge. Now, some of the municipalities have come forward and they want to build microgrids, you know, CHP plants. And they're building in the same area where the substations were flooded. How does it make sense? You know, if, if the substations get flooded, won't, be, won't the <coughs> CHP plants also will be flooded? Uh, no, it doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Maybe you guys know what to do. I, 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 you know, I think it's a question of policy and 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 politics. How how do we mobilize to uh, tackle these um, problems? I mean, what you're doing in Massachusetts in taking a comprehensive approach. Um, hopefully, things will turn around in New Jersey with the new governor. But all the efforts that we tried to put into working with the last governor in New Jersey were completely fruitless because um, there wasn't much of a commitment to using government to solve these kinds of problems. Um, I, you know, I think what I was saying about the flood maps is, is symptomatic that an ideological commitment to having the FEMA flood maps produced through a privatized contracted process. And that's, you know, I'm not quite sure the origin of that, but that has been the case for a long time. And so individual private companies produce these maps, and they tend to be a little different depending on which company. And if you don't like what one company produced for your state, you can go to another company and get a different result. So people don't really believe in the maps all that much anymore. They cost about $200 million a year to produce. The mapping process for the earthquake hazards in the United States cost $2 million a year for USGS to produce. I would imagine, I'm pretty sure that if the federal government set out to do coastal flood hazard mapping through NOAA and USGS, it would probably cost a tenth, if not less, of what it costs today. But there are a lot of interests at stake who won't be very um, happy about that change. So ideology plays a part in people's commitment to how you go about solving this problem. And I think until we step back and look at this objectively and figure out the best way without letting ideology interfere, um, we're going to continue to have these stupid outcomes. I think the professor is correct in terms of the politics because uh, you know, when you're looking at the politics of building a sustainable future, we really have to get the science right. We have to be educated as to where and what is going to happen if certain scenarios take place. And, and, uh, and if we know ahead of time, I'm talking about legislators now, if we know ahead of time what's going to happen to those substations, you didn't know it until Hurricane Sandy hit, but now we know it. Now we know what happens in Boston. Uh, to our subway system, where some of the entrances are right, you know, in, in areas like they were in Manhattan that just got flooded out. We know that's going to happen if we have another extreme weather event. So what are we doing about it? Not necessarily the executive branch, but the executive branch can do a lot of things, but they can't put things into law that go beyond their administration if it's not passed by the legislature. And so that's why it's so important for us to start to take a leadership role in this issue. I think maybe we have time for maybe two quick more questions. Yeah. Yes, On sir. that same point, Paul Pinsky, Maryland, um, 
we have a set of maps our natural resources put together, NOAA, USGS, and I played with the one, interactive. You can put two feet, four feet, sea level rise. If you want to put storm surge, category one, category two, hurricane, it's a separate set. They don't work together. And it sort of was symptomatic of that exact problem. So we actually put in some legislation that said the uh, Coast Mart that does siting for state projects had to include not just sea level rise, but storm surge. So they had to use both. Obviously, we've seen what happened in Houston. So we're forcing them to sort of take a broader view and stepping back from just simply being formulaic, you know, and, and having one path. So there are, there are many things that could be done along that line. Great. Great. And it's a really good document that was published a number of years ago by the National Research Council called Mapping the Zone, which was based on the success, I think, in North Carolina of their effort to, um, before climate change was legislated out of the state, um, they, they actually had a really good program for figuring out what their flood hazard was, mostly from rivers. But it's a great, you can get it online, it's at the National Research Council mapping the zone. Um, you know, Professor, I, I just throw one thing at you that, that I think as a legislator that's been involved for a number of years on these issues, I learned something from your presentation today. Uh, I had no idea that, you know, uh, Princeton was working with Harvard and a couple of other, other institutions looking at this underlying science that you have worked on. And many of us in the legislature uh, are working on these issues, but we're not, we're not aware as much as some people in the executive branch might be aware of data that is being provided. And so maybe that's a role that uh, you might be able to help us and CSG, Rona, in terms of getting that information out to all of us in terms of the existing science that is, that is out there for the Northeast. So at least we are aware of it, uh, because without being aware of it, then we can't, we can't ask the uh, difficult questions that need to be asked. Final question for this. Any, any takers? No? Well, I would ask, let's all uh, show our appreciation to the professor, and thank you very much.